I was born into a fairly religious family. My father very much follows in the footsteps of his own father, who's a Lutheran minister. I was raised in a family and culture that told me that God lived inside every single person on the planet, including me. That God was there listening to me every time I prayed to him. I was taught that God saw every thought in my head, every feeling I had, and most importantly, every action I took. By the time I was six, evangelical experiences were part of my daily life. I would talk to God quite often, as one might to an imaginary friend, although I never got a response. What I did get, though, was a presence. Whenever I spoke to God, I felt something there. I could sense his presence. I felt his presence particularly strongly whenever I did something sinful. I felt his disgust and disdain every time I did something that I thought he would consider unholy. Because of this, I knew he was always listening and always watching, and I knew he was real. But as I got older, I began to question the theological principles and implications held by Christianity. I won't go into detail, but by around age 13, I felt I had dismantled every logical aspect of my faith. Even so, I was still convinced that the subjective experiences of God's presence and the transcendent feeling of prayer proved the legitimacy of my beliefs, so I didn't leave the church entirely. Well, this would change two years later, when another imaginary being entered my life. After two months of daily meditation and tulpa forcing, Ori became a part of my everyday life. She replicated every single experience that I had previously attributed as being unique to God. You know, whenever we were in the same room together, her presence felt just like God's did during prayer. Not only that, but I could feel her feelings and emotional reactions to my behavior, just like I felt God's hatred in my heart every time I sinned. I deduced that either Ari was a heavenly deity herself, or that my subjective experiences didn't justify anything. I've been a-religious ever since. My experience is shared by many others in the community. You know, tulpas tend to transform many aspects of one's life and spirituality seems to be no exception. This all brings me to today's guest, Tanya Laherman. She's been a leading researcher on evangelical religion and auditory hallucinations for decades. Uh, her studies show that how I experienced God was far from exceptional. Today, Tanya is a professor of psychology and anthropology at Stanford University, with more awards and titles than I could hope to memorize for this introduction. We're going to have a discussion over evangelical religion, hearing voices, and how it all relates to tulpa and plural experiences. We're going to be questioning how ordinary, or unordinary, hearing voices really is. Please welcome Professor Tanya Leherman. All right. Let's go. All right. So you're an expert when it comes to experiences of evangelical religion and some and how schizophrenia varies between different cultures. So I was thinking that you would talk a little bit about your research and then I would provide some connections and insight on how those things relate to tulpamancy. So the first thing that I wanted to ask you was just to tell us, you know, what are evangelical experiences? So when people have spiritual experiences, they are having experiences that's of something typically they take to be not themselves. They, can, they have an experience in their body, but they identify the experience as being supernatural. So if you are, or and if you are, evangelical Christian, you're seeking to have a relationship with an invisible other who is invisible to other people, uh, who is God, your, your religion invites you to have a back and, fa back and forth dialogue with that person, to have a, have a relationship, a back and forth relationship. And you're also really invited to experience what's called the Holy Spirit. 
which is the sense of God's substance that kind of comes through your body in, very, in, in various ways. And so when folks are evangelical Christians, they will do things like they will um, they'll sometimes speak in tongues. So that's language-like sound. They don't, they don't really feel like they're generating the language. It feels like it comes to them from the outside. Uh, they will sometimes feel the Holy Spirit shoot through them. Um, so, and that's maybe less, I don't know whether that's relevant to Talpamansi. Well, it very but, much is. In fact, you said something in one of your New York Times articles about hearing voices that I'm going to bring up later that has a lot to do with Talpamansi. Okay, great. So what the, the piece of the experience of, of Christians that I think probably is pretty relevant to the experiences of Talpamansi is, the, is practices that help to make somebody experience this invisible being as more external, more agent, you know, some, something with its own agency. And what I see people doing is doing these meditation or prayer, prayer-like practices, prayer practices where they're really using all of their inner senses to represent this, uh, this being who's not materially present, so other people can't see God in the room. And I see that as people pray, and as they spend more time involved with their, their God, their sense of God's presence becomes more vivid. Their awareness of God, God's presence in the room becomes more acute. Their inner world, their inner senses seem to become sharper. And they seem to, and they sometimes have a sense that God speaks uh, with the way they can hear with their ears, or God touches them and they can feel it on their shoulder. It's like they have these sensory experiences that are not sensory experiences of something material. Right. And so something you just brought up was that you know these people don't go into the church already experiencing God. You know, they have to pray and do a lot of other things in order to experience God. So, yeah, how exactly does someone go from having no spiritual experiences to having one every single day? So people will, so it depends on the intensity of the experience. So, tip, so it's relatively rare for somebody to say they hear God with their ears every day, but that happens. Um, when... When they enter the church, if they haven't come from a church like this, they'll say things like, God never speaks to me. And what I can see is that six to nine months later, they can sometimes say, I recognize God's voice the way I recognize my mom's voice on the phone. And what I, what I think happens is that there is this practice, and I call it inner sense cultivation, and in which people are really using their inner attention to think about and to understand and to develop the their experience of this this being. So people will talk about, oh well, you know, when they pray, they're sitting in God's lap, or they're going for a walk with God, or they are, um, you know, standing in the throne room, or they are. They're doing something that's using their imagination. Um, sometimes people will call these relationships imaginal relationships because, you know, we're, you're, they're not making the claim that God is imaginary. They're making the claim that to experience God, you've got to use that human capacity for imagination. And that as you use this capacity, it somehow feels like what is imagined becomes more outside of you and more 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 agentic so people will sometimes like often people often christians feel that the first time they get it is when they are praying for other people so they're doing what's called prayer ministry and they are you know because when you're so sort of praying for yourself, it's I think it's really easy to experience that as let's pretend. It's only in your imagination. And when you pray for somebody else, you're, you are praying for somebody standing outside of you. And you know, you're, you're, the person is relaxed. The person who's praying 
It's really trying to concentrate on that person, but also simultaneously to concentrate on hearing God. And so they're sort of, you know, they'll talk about being open for God. And so if they get a mental image that feels spontaneous, I'll talk about it popping into their mind, they're more likely to say, okay, um, that may be from God. And then they speak it out loud to the person sitting next, standing next to them. And if that person is startled, like they say, oh my goodness, this, this, you know, I, it's amazing that you came up with that. Um, then the person who's doing the praying is also startled and thinks, oh my goodness, that wasn't me, that was God. So like one, one person said to me that she was praying for somebody and she kept getting this image of the baby and she, she knows she's not supposed to prophesy or pray out loud about a baby because that's so important to people and she can be wrong. And finally she said to this person she was praying for, I think there's a baby in your future. And she went home and, you know, and the woman who was praying went home and felt kind of like an idiot. And then she met the woman next, next week at church. And the woman said, did you know something? I was pregnant. I didn't know it. You were exactly right. So, so that's something like that is often the first time somebody has that, that sense of, Oh my goodness, this is not inside of me. It's outside of me. Mm -hmm. And I remember it, you referring to in one of your articles as the breakthrough moment. Yeah. And when I was reading that article, I just couldn't stop thinking about how similar that was to what we call the first contact in tulpomancy. And that is the first time you hear your tulpa's voice. And so let's, let's, let me start by saying that prayer is very similar to the tulpomancy technique narration. When you're in the process of first creating your tulpa, you're talking, it feels like you're talking to yourself, very similar to how you say prayer might feel if you're uh, just starting out. So what will happen is after weeks and weeks of you talking to this, what you hope will, will become an, an autonomous imaginary being, you telling it about um, how you want it to act, narrating to it about your feelings and how you want them to feel, um, telling them about the kind of being they will be when they are fully autonomous. After weeks and weeks of narrating and doing this, for me it was two months after I had been narrating when I got my first contact. I remember I was, I don't remember the exact words, but I was just walking by myself and I was in distress and I just heard a voice you know, telling me to relax, take a deep breath and to talk to her. And that voice, was that a voice that you heard with your ears or was that, was it, was that outside of you or inside of you or sort of in between? It was distinct from my thoughts, but it was still inside my mind. Okay. Does that sound like anything that you've heard um, evangelicals talk about? Absolutely. So often the, the challenge in an evangelical church is that you know that you're supposed to be in a relationship with God. And the church will say, you know, God is always talk talking. The question is, can you listen? And so the challenge for the evangelical is identifying that thought in the mind that is not your own thought, but is God's thought. And I thought that as they did that, um, as they were searching, often that they, they were more likely to have that experience. And there was often this, um, you know, often the first breakthrough moment came with this other person involved. But there was often a sense of another kind of moment in which somebody said, oh my goodness, this, this inner experience, this was not my thought, this was God's. And so that sense of otherness is quite is quite striking to people. I would say that um, people, evangelicals often have a, a sense of a continuum. You know, there's certain thoughts, certain events in their mind that are, it's very clear that this is God. And there are a lot other events that you're, they're not quite sure. You know, you're going to say it's God, it, but maybe it's not God. And does that, do you think that happens in Tulpomancy? Oh, if you just go onto a Tulpomancy forum and look at the most recent posts, half of them are 
did my tulpa say this or was it just me? Mm-hmm. There, you know, being able to create instill a distinct mind voice to your tulpa that's different from how your mind voice sounds, it's something that tulpas, tulpa dancers have to put a lot of effort into. So, you know, one of the things that evangelical churches and the tulpa community have in common is that they're both communities that help their um, participants distinguish what's God or what's a tulpa and what's yourself. So I remember in your TED talk, you talked about how, yeah, if you think God's telling you to like drop your job and move to LA, you know, come talk to us before you run off assuming that's a divine source. And same thing in the Tulpa community. You know, we go, hey, yeah, if your Tulpa says something that's consistent with their personality, that's helpful, yeah, go ahead and assume without any doubt that that was your Tulpa talking. But if it's telling you to, like, go kill yourself or something, that's probably not your Tulpa. And so in the Christian community, people are very alert to the questions about the nature of, uh, of God. And people will say, look, there is, there is God, and there's, a, there's the real God, but nobody ever encounters God directly. You have a representation of God. And so, you know, so part of the question is, what's, what's uh, true to your, what's the true, what's, what's truly God? And the other is, um, do you have any features of God that are part of your representation as a human that are just, that just shouldn't be there because they're mean or they are uh, difficult or, you know, you think, you know, God's supposed to be loving, but you really experience God as judgmental and, and uh, angry. Are you saying that these evangelicals, the voices they hear, and the presence they feel, do they acknowledge that that is not the true God? Do they, you just said that they felt, they said it's a representation. So are they acknowledging that it's sort of a mental construct and not really truly God that's talking to them? Yeah. I mean, I think it's a, people have very complicated ideas and I've been trying to think about how to describe this and understand it more precisely. It sounds like these churches are teaching tulpamancy. Yeah. The way that they're teaching you to distinguish between your thoughts, the way you're telling you, yeah, talk to God until he talks back. This is so similar to Tulpamancy. And now that you just said that it's not literally talking to God, but talking to a mental representation that you construct. Well, except that there's a sense that God, there really is a God who's dependent of you. So if you were to drop out of sight, you were to stop being a Christian, God would continue. And, but there's a sense that you reach God through the mind. So, you know, if you hear, so you have this human distortion, you know, so when you hear God, you're going to hear God through the distortions of your everyday humanness. But and if you get it right, you really will be experiencing God. Um, but, you know, and, you know, there's a lot of language about, you know, God only talks to you in a way you can handle and you know, that kind of stuff. So... There's something kind of different about the Tulpa world and the, the, the God world because there's a sense of this ultimate realness for, for the God folks. Just help us ever, um, are, are they ever discovered to be accidentally mean because of things, you know, as in the same way that sometimes people will have a, an experience of God and they'll suddenly discover that their God representation has anger they didn't imagine because they were basing their God representation partly on their dad and their dad was angry or somehow. Does that happen to people? It's very, very rare, but it does happen. I remember this this story of a Tulpa Mancer who created a Tulpa based on a cartoon character that was very, that was a, that was a psychopath. You know, she, um, the Tulpa was based on someone who would, kidnap and torture other cartoon characters and and as a result you know that tulpa didn't make the host very happy but it's very very rare to where that happens in general even tulpa mancers that that are have severe depression suicidal issues that create tulpas you know their tulpas usually help them a lot more than 
um, parroting those negative thoughts. Okay, that's really interesting. But what's also really interesting is that people, that doesn't happen very often to people. And that is, and that, that's intriguing. Mm -hmm. You know, I ran a survey last year where I, I got um, almost 200 responses. And out of those 200 responses, only one of them reported that tulpas had any sort of negative impact on their lives. Um, so it's very rare, but, you know, similar to God, I, I guess, you know, you're having a God that's mean like your father, There, it does happen once in a while with tulpas. But, yeah, speaking of mental health, I remember reading a paper by you where you talked about how speaking in tongues have mental health benefits. Uh, could you tell us a little bit about what you found? So, what... This is actually work, a lot of work that's been done, not by me, but um, experience, having a relationship with God um, has mental health benefits. So if, if, so if you have a relationship with God, it makes you happier. Um, you tend to report fewer mental health symptoms. If you have a relationship with a loving God, it's even better for you. So I think speaking in tongues, um, is often a very, for sometimes, not always, but for um, some people, it's a very powerful experience of God. And one of the things that I think is true about humans is that there are two dominant ways of mental techniques associated with spiritual practice. Um, one of them is, you know, Zen meditation, and the other is more this kind of the kind of stuff that the tuplemancers do that they're using their inner senses they're really concentrating on something but you're focusing on something in particular so that kind of that second kind of practice is a lot easier than meditation and i thought that tongues was an, like an, like an in-between form that was easy for people and, uh, and it seemed, you know, when I talk to people, they feel really good when they're speaking in tongues. And they have um, this visceral sense of God as, as real and present for them. I mean, in some sense, God is in them. And, you know, there are different kinds of tongue speaking. You can just speak in tongues because the pastor says, okay, everybody pray in tongues. Um, but the kind of tongues that I think are really good for you um, are those when people start talking in tongues and the tongues start to feel as if they're more external to them, they're just happening to them, and they are, in effect, going along for the ride. They're being caught up in this, you know, sort of hypnotic, trancey state. And the, you know, the tongues are flowing through them and they feel light and they feel really good and they feel really positive. And in Accra, people talked about speaking in tongues being good for, you know, healing colds. I mean, it's a very positive experience. And so I think, you know, it's pretty clear that, you know, developing a relationship with this, a positive, invisible other is good for you. It's pretty clear um, within, you know, limits. It's, it's that, and that's one of the challenges of, you know, of, of this world. Um, you know, you've got to kind of live with the invisible other. So the, the challenge of the invisible other is that you've got to make the invisible other, allow the invisible other to be real, but not also violate the everyday expectations of the material world. So there's something complicated there. But developing that relationship with a positive invisible other is good for your mental health. Um, tongues are a technique to help that invisible other feel really close and central. And so, um, you know, there, there's evidence that um, people who develop imaginary friends when they're young, uh, they're often, they're not kids who are mentally deficient. They're kids who are uh, creative and often a little more, more outgoing. And, you know, it's, it's... Score higher in empathy, too. Yeah. I remember reading about that. Yeah. And these and spiritual experiences, the people who have the capacity to have these relationships with invisible others, they also score more highly on empathy. Oh, really? Now, what I remember reading about 
um, speaking in tongues was that some people would describe it as a seamless exchange of emotion between themselves and God. Just you know, when you're speaking in tongues, language isn't a barrier to expressing your emotions. You just, as you said, go along for the ride. And what that reminded me of was a tulpa mancy technique where you and your tulpa, rather than communicating by words, simply send each other your literal raw emotions. So let's say I have a very close intimate relationship with my tulpa and I want to let them know how much I love them. You would just focus on feeling that love and just channeling it to your tulpa. But what's even more satisfying is your tulpa doing the same to you, where they focus on feeling the love they have for you and then channeling that raw emotion into you. And it feels amazing. It feels, uh, the way you described speaking in tongues, you start to feel light and giddy and just on the top of the world. You really do feel like there's something within you sending you these emotions. Am I making the right connection between that and speaking in tongues? Absolutely. That's very interesting. So I think when I talk to Christians, my sense is more that there are, there are moments where your people are overwhelmed by God's presence. And that's often an experience of love. And that's clearly, I think it makes people feel great. And it's, you know, and, and one of the things that uh, people are starting to know from the neuroscience is that the relationship with God really does serve as a social relationship. And it sounds to me like that's also true with the tulpa, that it becomes a social relationship. And it's, um, you know, there's probably a range of, you know, just as there's a range of kinds of relationships with God, there's probably also a range of kind of relationships with tulpas. And some people are really able to have that back and forth love and some people aren't and some people, you know, you, you were talking about, you know, you, you get worried about some telpomancers, maybe there's something more complicated going on with them. But I think even if there's something more complicated going on with them, I think being able to experience this invisible being as being, you know, sending you your, that, your, their love is pretty amazing. Definitely. You know, one of the most common misconceptions about hearing voices and these sort of spiritual experiences is that they're rare and that they're harmful or pathological. You know, how common are these experiences in reality? Oh, they're pretty common. So it depends on how you ask the question. If you just say to um, somebody, if you show up with a clipboard, uh, and you say, have you ever heard a voice when, you, when you're, you've you been alone? You get a rate of, depend, you know, if, the, if it's the question is on its own or in a, or in embedded in a list of questions about psychiatric stuff, you get a rate of about 10 to 15%. If the question is embedded in a set of questions about spiritual experience, you get a rate of about 50%. If you give people a series of statements in which they're in the person says the statement says i thought i heard a voice it really sounded like a voice i went but my husband wasn't there i guess i made it up but it really sounded like a voice has that ever happened to you then you get a rate of 70 to 80 percent so if someone has the, the opportunity to say um I had this experience, I know it wasn't real, but I really felt I had a sensory experience. That's really common. So what we're less confident of, or one of the things that people are really interested in these days, is how many people are there who have those experiences, not occasionally, but pretty often. And there's a lot of interest in trying to... Um, see, you know, and understand how, you know, whether that is, um, can be a non-pathological experience. So, I mean, you're correct, you're entirely correct. I mean, in, people used to think that schizophrenia, 
that was that was the condition in which you heard voices. And that was the, you know, that you know, hearing voices in our society kind of means being psychotic. But it's pretty clear that there are um, some people who have very frequent voice hearing experiences. And, and I, sus I suspect there are different kinds of people who fall into that category. I suspect that there are people who are very high practitioners. They're very, like, a bunch of tuple masters I bet fall into that category of working really hard to allow your imagination to enable the creation of this externally present being. That's one kind. Well, that's I bet that's one category. Um, and I bet that you know you are right that the more highly you score in absorption, the more highly you score in hypnotizability, the more likely you are to be in that category. Then, then I bet there are people who um, are people who could have schizophrenia, could fall ill with psychosis, but they have learned to manage their unusual sensory experiences, and they and and so they in effect have, those experiences are somehow more under control than they are for people who end up needing hospital care. And then I think there are people with the weird sensory um, capacities. So I've talked to people who hear voices in the vacuum cleaner. There is a combination be between ambiguous input, you know, top-down willingness to experience. So with that all being said, you know, why do you think I remember reading something about you coming up with an evolutionary explanation of why it's so easy to hear voices. You know, as you just said, some people might try to hear a voice in a vacuum cleaner, but is there a larger evolutionary explanation? Well, I think there's a larger evolutionary explanation for why humans search for agency. So one of the things that's pretty clear about humans is that we are very good at seeing agents everywhere. So we do what's called anthropomorphism. You know, we see faces in the clouds, to use Stuart Guthrie's description. We um, see, you know, faces on our, on our cars. You know, we, um, it's very easy for us. And, you know, you, you walk outside at night, and if you're in the forest, it's like, my goodness, there are bears everywhere, right? It's just, you know, you're, you're, you're just looking for those, the, those, those agents. And that probably comes from the fact that, you know, thousands of years ago, um, our ancestors, you know, tens of thousands of years ago, um, longer, our ancestors were more likely to be lunch if they didn't look for late agency all the time. So the way people usually tell the story is, if you hear a rustling in the bushes, 99% you know, of the time, it's the wind. But and so, but if you acted, if you heard a rustling in the bushes, and you were, you know, if you're a human in roaming over on the savanna, um, you know, you're not a well-protected human. You're pretty vulnerable. Human bodies are pretty vulnerable. If you hear a rustling in the bushes, and you always behave as if it's the wind, the one in a hundred time it's a, you know, it's some kind of predator, you're going to be lunch. And so our ancestors and our ancestors evolved this cognition, and I mean nobody has any good idea about when this, what point this took place in human, you know, human evolution. But you know, as our ancestors were more likely to have survived if they leap to the inference that there's an agent. So that's a good push for why you get this very impulsive intuition that there's something else there. It's also, though, countered with this other in intuition, which is that, um, which is why you need to practice so hard. You know, the other intuition is, you look at the bush, there's nothing there. You know, you, um, you we're pretty good at distinguishing between things that are real and things that aren't real. And to sustain that sense that there really is this watchful, invisible presence, you've got to 
really work to enable yourself not to kind of like, oh, blow it off and see it as not real. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Let's talk about your research with schizophrenia. So I remember seeing two major things you've written about. The first one is about how schizophrenia varies from culture to culture. Can you tell us a little bit about this research and what you found? So um, I'll back up and say that in some crude way, schizophrenia doesn't vary from culture to culture. So there's some, you know, schizophrenia is a messy concept. I mean, it's, it's, there's no other term that does its job in picking out a pattern of behavior, but we know that in the basket created by the diagnostic category, there are lots and lots of different kinds of people. That said, there are, um, people who are flagrantly ill in the same way everywhere in the world, as far as we can tell. But, um, you know, but it nevertheless, you know, other people have found that in some parts of the world, particularly outside of the West, schizophrenia has a more benign course and outcome. So if somebody falls ill in India and you look at them two years later, they look a lot healthier than somebody in the U.S. who falls ill. And there are probably a number of reasons for that. You know, there's less homelessness, people stay with their families, and that kind of stuff. Um, my research is about their voice hearing experience. So in my experience, uh, in my research, I find that Americans, if you have schizophrenia, you've got a 60 to 80 percent chance of hearing voices, which are these these auditory things that are kind of like in your mind and in the world and, you know, that you have good voices and bad voices and murmuring voices and commanding voices and all, goodness knows what. The Americans tend to hate those experiences. They don't know, in my research, I found that Americans hate those experiences. They have, they experience, they, 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 rarely say that their voice hearing experiences are positive or exclusively positive or predominantly positive. What they hear is not person-like. So they tend not to, in my research, uh, people tended not to know who was speaking. So they, and by that I mean they hadn't met in the flesh the person whose voice they, 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 they were hearing. So they heard the beast, or they heard the entity, or they heard M, but it wasn't like their mom. And in India, uh, where I did, did a chunk of research, people with schizophrenia who hear voices, they're more likely to say that they like the experience. They don't like being sick, but they like hearing their voice. They're more likely to say that they hear their mom, or their dad, or their uncles, you know, that the voice is more likely to give them good ex good advice, like, you know, don't drink, don't stay up late, you know, clean up, do your chores. In Ghana, people were also more likely to say that this the, the voice was person-like. They're also more likely to say that they heard, heard God, and they were more likely to insist that they only heard God, that it, they only had positive experiences. And so... You know, it seemed like the experience of voice hearing, I mean, there was this paradox where in Ghana and India, the experience, the voice was sort of more real, it was more person-like, and it was a better experience. In the U.S., the voice was more alien. It was more disliked. It felt like the mind was broken and something terrible was happening and people wondered whether they were crazy and and they didn't have a, a real relationship. I mean, they might miss their voices once they were gone. That's what we find. But they didn't have a confidant in the same way. So what do you think created the difference? Is it, is it that hearing voices is stigmatized much more than the West than it is in the East, where you know there's a lot more, oh, hey, you hear the voices of your ancestors. Whereas in the West, it's more like, if you hear voices, you have a disorder. I think, it, I think it's much more stigmatized. I mean, mental illness is plenty stigmatized in India and Ghana. Um, but hearing voices is not 
typically the leading indicator of mental illness. You know, mental illness is identified when you behave in a weird way. Uh, and so voice, voice hearing doesn't have quite the same charge as it has in our culture where, you know, you might actually identify mental illness by weird behavior, but we associate voice hearing with mental illness. Um, so I think that's a big part of it. Um, what I think is going on, I can't quite prove this, what I think is going on is that when people fall ill with schizophrenia, and this makes psychosis and schizophrenia different from other ways of being in the world. When you start to fall ill, there uh, a lot of stuff starts to seem different. And there's a sense of the world becomes real in different ways. And people, when they start having, when people start having auditory experiences, they seem to have a lot of variety of auditory experiences. And I think the Americans listen to and remember the bad stuff more than other cultures. Which is not to say that there aren't terrible voices heard by folks in India and, 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 uh, and Ghana. But I, I suspect that there's a kind of habituated listening. Uh, there's a way in which people come to pay attention to some of these experiences more than others. And they interpret them in more positive or in more person-rich ways. I think that's probably better for people. Right. And that brings me into the second thing I wanted to talk about, which is a new medication-free way you found to treat schizophrenia. So if experiencing voices in more person-like ways is healthier, yeah. please tell us what you found. So this is not my, uh, my discovery, but there's a whole body of practices now that help people basically to use tulpamancy-like practices to help people who are ill. And they, uh, and it is, it's, um, you know, some people prefer to take medication while doing this, some people don't. The subjects here are people who hear distressing voices. They do not like this experience. They have ended up in hospitals. They, uh, and often when people are in this rut of voice hearing, it's pretty destructive. So they're hearing a voice that's, you know, shouting at them, you're worthless, you're worthless, you should die. You smell, you're disgusting. I mean, terrible, terrible things. There, let me talk about two techniques that people are using these days. One comes out of the Hearing Voices Group, which is a very interesting set of communities. It's kind of a grassroots, it's called consumer-driven, meaning that the, the primary actors here are people with who hear voices. Um, and what they do is they teach you, they basically teach people to treat their voices like people. So they say, find out the name of the, the, the voice, talk to the voice, negotiate with the voice, and be respectful of the voice. It has something to teach you, even your meanest and most awful voice. And so, and they really treat the voices as people. So, you know, the cl clinicians are often like, this is not rational, these voices. They're te saying terrible things. You should try to ignore them. But the, um, this hearing voices technique, they say, you know, you should be in a group. The group, you'll be able to share your experience. You'll learn from other people. And you should, again, name, respect, and, you know, negotiate and interact. And some people really find that this helps. There's another technique that really amps up this practice, which is um, a called avatar therapy. And we're, they're still sort of trying to figure out whether this is helpful for everybody. But it's, um, in other words, all people who hear voices. But in this, this technique, they, um, well, in the first study that was published, they took 16 people who'd been hearing negative voices, bad voices for years. And they take the patient, and the patient, you know, is in front of a computer screen, and the patient picks an avatar to represent the voice, and uh, and then picks a voice timbre, so the voice, you know, so the voice sounds as close as it can to the the voice the person is hearing, um, 
and then the therapist like is operating you know the computer in, an, in another room so this is not mysterious you know the, the you have the, the avatar head is on the screen and I think there's also a box that represents the therapist so the therapist then speaks to the patient to the subject in the voice of the mean voice so the therapist knows the patient well the therapist knows that the voice often says you're worthless you should die you know you are just you're never going to amount to anything and you know so the voice comes on screen the therapist makes the avatar head speak those terrible things the patient's kind of freaked out and then the clinician gets into the box and says okay so I think you should tell the voice that you're not worthless. Do you have a reason to think that you're not worthless? And the patient says, yeah, I'm nice to my mom. So, okay. The therapist says, now I want you to talk to the voice and tell the voice that you are not worthless. And so the therapist is coaching the patient to have this back and forth relationship just the way the hearing voices group coaches the patient. And with the avatar, you know, when a per with the avatar, it might even be more effective because, you know, the voice is so vividly present. Um, and in, in any event, this initial study found that like three people found their voices went away entirely and a lot of other people were helped. You know what this reminds me of is when I was doing my research on tulpamancy and its impact on mental health. I had a few individuals with schizophrenia in my sample, and they reported that since that their tulpa had immense influence over the voices, more control over the voices than they did. So some tulpamancers with schizophrenia just said that, yeah, I hear voices all the time, but it's good to hear a positive one from a tulpa for a change. But two, two others said, that their tulpa had an ability, unlike them, to distinguish between hallucination and reality. And then one tulpa mancer actually said that their tulpa had the ability to zap away unwanted auditory hallucinations, that their tulpa could actually will away those negative voices. Have you ever heard anything like that? No, I would love to talk to those people. That would be fantastic. As would I. Too bad I made that study anonymous. Uh. Yeah. You know, you could definitely, hey, if you want to research this, just pull up, hey, looking for tulpamancers with schizophrenia, put that in the Reddit tulpas and find... It's a really good idea. Oh, yeah. That actually would be great. It's, um, yeah. So, and actually, I'm going to, I'd love to talk to, to tulpamancers who hear, who don't have schizophrenia, but who hear active voices. Well, that's a lot of tulpamancers. That's like 20% of tulpamancers who auditory, auditorily hallucinate their tulpa's voice. Yeah. I, um, yeah. So that is, it's, um, I mean, it's, a, it's really interesting. And understanding those two groups, understanding people who do not have psychosis but have active voice hearing experience, and understanding people with schizophrenia who um, have a positive tulpa that helps them. Those actually are really important people to talk to because they um, will eventually teach us how to teach folks with schizophrenia how better to handle their voices. I mean, there, there are a bunch of researchers who are actually really excited about trying to understand um, those, two, those two groups of people, um, understand what's, you know, what's different about them, what's, sim what's, what's similar, but and above all, what enables some people to have uh, voices, beings that are helpful, um, you know, when there are other people who are just struggling? I mean, it's a really interesting question. And I think that we could have some ideas on that. Um, I think that you, you've talked about a lot of ideas on why that is already, but you say there's a lot of researchers, so not just you, me, Vasir, and like the two other researchers that have published on this, but there's genuine interest in the field of psychology and understanding this? Absolutely. 
Absolutely. So there, there are people like, um, I mean, they're often English. And, you know, and people come at this from different positions. So the folks who do are the schizophrenia researchers, they're like, I want to prove that you can hear voices and it's healthy. And they want to include, say that, oh, those people might have schizophrenia. You know, I am more of the kind of researcher who says, you know, no, it's not all schizophrenia. I mean, I'm really committed to the view that there are different you know, there's this kind of dissociative hypnotizability absorption domain, which means that there, and that's a different process. It's more like mental imagery training. Um, but we're sort of at the beginning of trying to understand this. So, yeah, there, there are a lot of people. So, you know, would love to recruit you as a co-researcher. Oh, my gosh. Um, yes, yeah, send him... Show them Tulpa Mansi, send them the Tulpa community, show them this this video that I produced from our interview. That's, I had no idea that there was this much interest. Yeah, no, there's a lot of interest. And um, and it's it suddenly dawned on people. It's so really, you know, it's another thing that's going on in the schizophrenia research field is that people have suddenly realized that there's much more variation than we thought. And uh, so, on the one hand, you know, there, there's, I, I'm pretty committed to the, view, to the view that there are different kinds of people who um, end up with active voice hearing experience. You know, some who have a psychotic process and some who do not. But it's also pretty clear that there are some people who have what might be a psychotic process, but they're really managing it remarkably well and it's um and so it's as the community of researchers has begun to discover that wow this thing that we call psychotic process many people who are very healthy seem to have it now a lot of puzzlement about what exactly that that means you know, what, what is a psychotic process so anyway that i, I yeah we, we will we'll, we'll do that we'll do that so you know We've been talking for a while, so maybe we should come back and talk again. I agree. I agree. Today we talked a lot about evangelical religion, schizophrenia. Maybe next time we could talk a little bit more about tolerance and plurality in general. Yeah. That sounds great. Yeah, I'll, I'll love to talk to you again. All right. Do you have any questions for me? Anything else you want to address? Um, no, let's save that for next time. I'll go back and these things. Yeah. Excellent. All right. Well, have a lovely rest of your day. See you next time. See you next time. Bye. Take care. All right. Well, you guys heard that. Looks like we're going to have her on again. Hope you guys enjoyed that discussion, and hopefully we'll be doing it again soon. See you next time.